John 5, I want you to notice again. Beginning, of course, the first two words of verse 1, you'll notice it says, after this. After this, there was a feast of the Jews. After what? Well, you'll notice the previous verse, that's chapter 4, verse 54 says, this is again the second miracle, which is namely the healing of the nobleman's son. So that is the Lord Jesus' second miracle in his public ministry. What was his first miracle? Well, you know, it was chapter 2, the wedding and the wine at Cana. In other words, these two words now, after this, are a reminder to us that the Gospel of John is a catalog, if you will. It is a record. It's a record of divine origin that's given with a very specific purpose. The purpose is stated in the book. John 20, verse 30, many other signs, miracles, truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But... These, that first miracle, that second miracle, and this third miracle, these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, and that believing ye might have life through his name. Not all the miracles that Jesus ever did. In fact, John, you remember, said if everything he did were written, the books, the world couldn't contain the books. So not all of the miracles are written down. That's pretty amazing. I wonder what signs and what wonders John saw and undoubtedly wanted to write down. But with pen in hand, the Spirit of God said no. Not that sign. Not that miracle. Not that healing or that wonder. Don't record that, but do record this. Do record this third miracle here at the pool of Bethesda. As most of you know, the word Bethesda, the Hebrew word, means house, Beth, house of mercy. And beloved, it is here at this amazing scene. It is here that we find ourselves in the midst of one of the most consequential, pivotal moments in Christ's ministry. In fact, in so very many ways, this is the turning point. Right here, this is the turning point for our Lord Jesus. The miracle of the wine and the nobleman's son, those were basically private miracles. Private in nature, small gatherings, family. But this miracle is in full view of all the public. It's on the Sabbath day. It's during a busy feast. Look at verse 1, before we pray. After this, there was a feast of the Jews. And Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now, there was at, here he is at Jerusalem by the sheep market, a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. Now, wait a minute. Think about this. The Lamb of God at the sheep gate on the Sabbath Outside the temple, by the pool that has five porches, five is the number of grace, during the feast, at the house of mercy, he's going to throw down the gauntlet as to who he is. So much so that it instantly changes everything. Look at verse 14. Afterward, Jesus findeth him in the temple, the one he's going to heal, and said unto him, Behold, thou art made whole. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee. The man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus which had made him whole. And therefore, because of that, did the Jews persecute Jesus and sought to slay him because he had done these things on the Sabbath day. But Jesus answered them, my father worketh hitherto and I work. Now watch this. Therefore, the Jews sought the more to kill him. Because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but also said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. Well, folks, there it is. At the house of mercy, a battle line is drawn that inevitably leads to a cross at Calvary, which is where, again, the mercy of God was on full display. After this, at the pool of Bethesda, at the house of mercy, nothing would be the same again. Nothing would be the same for this man, and nothing would be the same for the ministry of our Lord. Let's pray. Father, please help us this morning to understand why these are written, that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written if all that Jesus did, but these are written, that this miracle is given for our learning and admonition. May we hear it and heed it for those in this room who are still at this moment spiritually impotent and blind. Raise them up by your grace in Jesus' name. Amen.
Three things I want us to consider this morning in light of this third miracle in the ministry of Jesus. There are three things in the healing of this man who was paralyzed and powerless. And the first thing you'll notice, number one, is this condition. Number one is the condition of the man. Look at verse 2. Now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. In these, in these porches, that is, these shelters, lay a great multitude of impotent folk, of blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. Their word impotent literally means without power. It means invalid. It means disabled and helpless. Verse 5, and a certain man. Now, there's a great multitude there, but there's also a certain man. And a certain man was there which had an infirmity 30 and 8 years. By the way, it's very interesting to me that in this first public demonstration of Jesus Christ's power and authority as the Messiah of Israel, that out of this great, great multitude of people of lame and incapable people, a perfect illustration of the blind, hopeless, and impotent nation that he was sent to. It's just a thing that Jesus would choose a man who had been lame for 38 years. And I say that because of Deuteronomy. You'll notice on the screen, Deuteronomy chapter 2 and verse 14, it says, And the space in which we came from Kadesh Barnea until we were come over the brook Zered was 38 years. Until all the generation of the men of war were wasted. In other words, note this, for 38 years, the nation of Israel was hopeless, paralyzed, and lame. And what could they say for all those 38 years now? They could say, sir, we have no man. There is no man who can lead us, who can take us into the promised land. But what happened? After 38 years, God did have a man, a man named Joshua. Yeshua, the Hebrew name, is Jesus. It is the same. He was a type of Christ. And this man led them to a land of blessing and promise. Verse 6 of our text. When Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he saith unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? The eminent man answered him, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool, but why I am coming, another steppeth down before me. It's amazing. But that's not all, folks, because the Jews who sought to persecute the Lord Jesus that day were very well aware of an Old Testament prophecy that was given to them in order to identify their Messiah. Several. Isaiah 35, 6 says, then shall the lame man leap as a heart or a deer. A prophecy about healing, a prophecy about deliverance. So what happened to this man? What happened to this man, beloved, could have happened spiritually to the entire nation had they simply recognized Jesus as their Messiah. And so now with the context of all of this, hopefully this miracle in your mind, I want you to think again about this man's condition. He said, sir, I have no one. I have no person when the water is moved. I don't have a chance. I'm paralyzed. I'm hopeless. And I'm helpless. And for 38 years, I have laid here in this place and watched one person after another get into the water before me. 38 years, I have no man. I'm unable to save myself. This, of course, is the exact testimony of the lost all around us, of the lost world in New Guinea and Papa, they have no man, not themselves, not a priest, not a theologian, certainly not a, the- a politician. They have no answer for their condition, the condition of the world. They're a great multitude in a grave condition. It is a multitude, by the way, that all of us here used to belong to, all of us, and we would still belong to, except something happened. One day at your pool of Bethesda, at the house of mercy, the Holy Spirit of God, the Lord Jesus, whispered in your ear, wilt thou be made whole? Do you want to be saved? Do you want deliverance? Do you want healing and forgiveness for your sin? One day, somebody cared for your soul. In fact, in my case, there were a lot of somebodies who cared for my soul. My mom, my bus captain, my bus driver, a classmate, a Sunday school teacher, a pastor, a deaf lady. People prayed for me, a little girl. Which brings us to the second thing in the text. 
Number one is the condition. Number two, you'll notice the compassion. Verse six, when a Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he saith unto him, wilt thou be made whole? Now, folks, I want you to notice very carefully what John writes. Because the text says not only that Jesus saw this burdened man and his condition, it also says he knew. He knew how long he had been. He knew his condition. Jesus knew that for a long time he had been in this place, and he knew that for 38 years no man, not one person, cared enough to help him in. Apparently not even a family member. Family members give up on you in situations like this so often. I'm reminded of the married couple who decided it was time to get rid of their family pet, Danny the, ha- the hamster. Well, since it was mom's idea to get the pet, they argued that she should break the news to the kids. They could be heartbroken. So one night mom says, kids, I'm sorry to tell you this. It's time for Danny to go. I've called. I found a new home. It's going to be fine. And so after a long pause, the kids said, well, it's okay, mom. It's been around a long time. We'll miss him. But since you're the one who always cleans and feeds him and we understand, another child says, yeah, he was messy and stuff. And so the mom, very pleased at how these kids are taking all of this, said, okay, kids, let's Let's all take Danny to his new house, go get the cage. And immediately with one voice, the kids all said, Danny, we thought you said daddy. (laughs) It always hurts when it's your own the most, amen? But seriously, where is this man's family? I have no one, no man. Here's a man who has no one, nobody, who cares for his condition. No friends, no family, no fellow citizens. When George Matheson took his young bride and pulled her aside one day before they were married and they were just engaged and had to tell her that he was told by the doctors that he was going blind. Edwin eventually loses eyesight. His bride-to-be left him. She didn't sign up for that, she said. And he was so heartbroken. At 20 years of age, he had to live with his sister who was a godsend to him as he entered into the ministry as she took care of him. Soon his sister was engaged, and he attended the wedding. And on the night of her wedding, when everyone was gone, it was long gone, he found himself alone in his room. Sitting in the darkness there, and though he preached to crowds of 1,000 and sometimes 1,500 every week in complete blindness, he was tempted to despair and quit. But that night, he penned the words of his beloved hymn, O love that will not let me go. I rest my weary soul in thee. I give thee back the life I owe, that in thine ocean depths its flow may richer, fuller be. That great hymn was birthed from the revelation that if nobody else on earth is there and nobody else on earth seems to care, the Lord Jesus does both. The Bible says that when Jesus saw That certain man, according to verse 5, when the Lord Jesus saw him, he also knew him. He knew how long he had been alone in that condition. He knew what that man needed. And the Lord Jesus, who knew his condition, cared. He cared about his condition because he cared about him. It may be today that you too can testify, Pastor, it just seems like I have no man. I have no person I have no one who cares enough or knows enough about my situation to take notice and help me. And that may be true. Or should I say it may have been true? Because you know something? The real reason we're even here today, the only reason I'm standing behind this pulpit, the reason that this local church even exists, the reason for this building, for that choir, for live stream, the only reason for this service is to tell you and anybody and everybody else we can what was once told to us, that there is a man, the Son of Man, whose mercy reaches out to your heart, whose mercy has made provision for your eternity, whose mercy has the answer for your soul. Wilt thou be made whole? 
Do you want forgiveness of sin and cleansing and eternal life? Then realize that the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, loves you, and he doesn't just love you, he knows you. I've often thought about this, and I think about it right now. The Lord Jesus, who knows everything about me, the God who knows everything about you. I don't know everything about you. I'm kind of glad about that, to be honest with you. Aubrey, I don't want to know everything about you. But the one who knows everything about you loves you. He has set his love upon you. Number one, the condition. Number two, the compassion. The third thing you'll notice, number three, is the cure. Verse 8, Jesus saith unto him, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. And immediately, this is not some Benny Hinn thing, amen? 38 years, paralyzed. Rise, take up your bed, and walk. And immediately the man was made whole. And took up his bed and walked, and on the same day was the Sabbath. You see, folks, it's one thing for people to have feelings of compassion to care. But it is another thing entirely to have the power and ability to do something about that compassion. Jesus, he doesn't just care that you're lost. He cures the lost. In fact, you realize that the leaders in this text, they didn't seek to kill the Lord Jesus because he cared about this man. They didn't seek to put him to death because he had compassion. No, 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 no. They sought to kill him because he was God. And as God, he had the power to cure this man. For which is easier, Jesus said, to say thy sins be forgiven thee or take up thy bed and walk? Well, guess what? The Lord Jesus Christ can do both because he's God. Jesus doesn't just have a cure. He is the cure. And regardless this morning of how sin sick people are, he could go down to a a clan and a tribe in Papua New Guinea and find a young man who was raised without the gospel, without the Bible, without any knowledge in the light of Christ and make that man a trophy of God's grace. The Lamb of God taketh away the sin of the world. There was a little boy in Tennessee, I remember his dad was a bus mechanic. When he grew up, he said he always wanted to be a mechanic, too, as a little, little guy, fixing engines and transmissions and wheels. And every time they would sing in church the song, Wonderful, Gra- Wonderful Grace of G, the little boy mistakenly would say, broader than the scope of my transmission. <laughs> I don't know about your transmission, but I know that his grace is infinitely broader than all of our transgressions. And what exactly is it that appropriates that grace, that miracle, that healing, that mercy? I can tell you. It is stated, beloved, in one of the absolute greatest texts in all of the Bible. It's a single verse spoken by the Lord Jesus that describes perfectly the cure that he offers. If anybody wants to tell you this is the gospel that gives the definition, for the reason why it's written, these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ and believing you might have eternal life. That's the reason for this book. And if anybody wants to add to the gospel that's given in this book, you have to take this sacrament and do this and keep on and so forth. Just remember. Remember the word believe all through this book and remember this one verse. Verse 24. Verily, verily, Jesus is speaking truly, truly. Verily, verily, truth, truth, amen, amen, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Wow. Can I ask you a question? Can you get any simpler and any more wonderful than that? What did he say? Hear the word, believe the word, have everlasting life, believe the gospel. And instantly he says, you are passed from death unto life and shall not come into condemnation. Glory to God. Now, folks, that is what you call a cure, not a therapy, not a relief, not a remedy. This is a cure. And all that this man had to do to receive this deliverance is trust the Lord Jesus, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Jesus said in verse 8, rise, take up thy bed and walk. And the lame man says what? Ah, it can't be that easy. That's too easy. What's the catch? Where do I pay the money? Where do I do my penance? What do you mean get up and walk? I've been lying here for 38 years. Surely at least I need to do some exercises, some therapies. Jesus said, get up. Take up your bed and walk. I remember when Oswald J. Smith once compared trust, faith, as we sang a few moments ago, to teaching someone to float. Float in water. And his illustration resonated with me because we taught our boys to float in our, a little tiny pool that we had. And we would say, like, Andy, I want you, the water will sustain your weight. All you have to do is just trust the water. Just turn yourself back. Just lay back and just, just trust the water. And he did. He threw himself back in the water and he floated straight to the bottom of the pool. <laughs> and we'd say, don't tighten. Why'd you tighten your muscles why do you hold your breath? The water holds up entire navies. It's going to hold up your scrawny little body with broomstick arms. You have no problem. So we tried it again and again like all the boys. And the very first time, they threw themselves back and just trusted without any effort on their own. They floated. Stop trying. Start trusting. And that brings us to the fourth thing. The condition, the compassion, the cure, number four, there is also a command. I want all of God's people to hear this very carefully. Verse 8 of the text, Jesus saith unto him, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. Now, wait a minute. You do realize that three times John repeats that same command in this narrative. Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. In verse 11, the last line, take up thy bed and walk. Verse 12, take up thy bed and walk. That bed, you understand, was nothing more than a filthy collection of rags. And as such, it represented every bad, negative thing about his life, about his past. It symbolized his entire life, his old life. So Jesus said, pick it up. The bed doesn't control you anymore. You control it. And then he said this. Verse 14. Afterward, Jesus findeth him in the temple and saith unto him, Behold, thou art made whole. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee. The man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus which had made him whole. Wow, that is a change. Understand this. This is what salvation is all about. Take up your bed and lest the worst thing, you know what? Now you can live in victory over sin. Salvation is a deliverance, a cure, a release from the debt of sin and the power of sin. And it is so. So that when you're cured, when you're delivered, others will see your life and glorify God. And what Christ is saying to us, beloved, is that you don't want to go back and lie down on those old, dirty rags anymore, do you? You've been delivered. You don't want to go back to that old life, the bondage of those old debts. You're whole, the Bible says. You can go and, and have victory over sin. There's a famous story of a soldier under Alexander the Great. During a time of a very heated battle, he, he grew afraid and he started to turn and run. He was brought to the commander. He was brought to, right before Alexander himself because so many people had seen this. And the great king of Macedon asked his soldier why he fled. And the soldier, looking down at the ground, said, I was afraid, sir. The king said, what's your name? And the soldier paused for a long time, and he said, my name is Alexander. And the king said, as he stood up, and before he allowed him to return to his post, which almost never happened, he said, soldier, either change your name or change your behavior. You're a child of God. You're a Christian. How many times do we go out in this world, and I'm a Christian? as they're living a life of sin and selfishness and greed. Either change your name or change your behavior. 
Why would a believer ever, a child of the living God, want to go back to the old filthy cushion of rags that always symbolizes a life of bondage and without Christ? Behold, thou art made whole, sin no more, give glory to God. By the way, look again at verse 6. When Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he saith unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? Do you ever think about that? I know you have. I have many times. Think about the Lord Jesus asking that question for just a moment. Why would you ask a man who's been lame for 38 years if he wants to be healed? Like my dad said, Jimmy, do you want a spanking? Well, let me think about that. (laughs) Would you ask a man who's drowning, hey, do you want a life preserver? Would you like to be rescued? Fifty years ago, I might have thought this was a redundant question. But I've since grown to understand that it's a deep question. That a lot of people don't want God's cure God's way. In fact, a lot of people don't even recognize that they're really drowning, that they're really sick. And when Jesus looks at this man, he knows him. He knows him. And he knows that maybe this man had grown accustomed to the routine of this porch and the filthy mat and all of his excuses. And maybe the idea of getting up and going back to work and being a part of society and all that change wasn't for him. Just maybe, just maybe, because I've talked to people out witnessing who are just exactly like that. So, you know, the first order of business is to want and to desire the cure, to recognize that you are powerless And then he could obey the command, rise, take up thy bed and walk, and understand salvation and deliverance. You understand that it did not come this day to the house of works. It did not come to the house of religion or the house of determination. It came to this man at Bethesda, the house of mercy, which is where salvation always comes. Ephesians 2, 3, we were all children of wrath, just as others But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, hath raised us, he hath raised us up together. There are a lot of signs and a lot of miracles and a lot of wonders that Jesus did that are not in the Bible. But these are written that you might believe. Might believe what, Pastor? Might believe that it doesn't matter how long, 38, 48, 58 years, how long you have been lying there in your sin, impotent to do anything about your soul. It doesn't matter. God's grace is deeper than that, greater than that. And what you need to do is believe. It's the house of mercy. And if you have believed, go and sin no more. Walk out those doors. Determine. Doesn't mean you're going to be perfect. Doesn't mean you're going to be sinless ever. It means that you're going to walk in the light of the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. And thus give testimony to him. And God's people said, let's bow our heads, shall we, for just a moment.